the uh, realize you have the benefit of a lot of sugar and coffee going through your system as we talk about coho. So that should be a good thing as you're fighting off last night's hangover. That's uh, so it's good to go first. Um, and it's also great to meet you in person. I mean, uh, the way like I've known you is on the little photograph next to my iPhone 4 on my Twitter app. So seeing you in real life is actually much more, much more way more exciting. So uh, I'm sure, it's not again, a little disappointing too. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm home now. <laughs> only for you, Chris. Ten years ago. Yeah. <laughs> so, Speaking only for myself. Uh, I, for one, I'm not nearly as cute as my Twitter avatar. I was going to say that. Yeah. I, you know, thanks for the time and, uh, you know, in the interest of using two hours and I realize this is the tech field day, I have uh, Andrew Warfield, my co-founder, probably infinitely smarter at those things than me, but I uh, just thought I'd give you an introduction to Coho Data. Um, so uh, my co-founders and I, we started Coho Data in like October of 2011. Um, yeah, sure. that was, and we all left Citrix to start uh, Coho, and we got to Citrix through the Zen Source acquisition. Wow. And then Mark pissed you off? Pardon? And then Mark pissed you off? No, Mark's actually a good guy. He was, uh, he, he made a, he made a valiant attempt to keep the Zen team together <laughs> and so forth. And, uh, um, they, uh, now essentially it was around, you know, some of the thoughts that Andy and, and, uh, and Kier had in terms of how stories should be for the, like, the next five years. And um, you know, basically with a few things sort of coming together, um, SDN, PCIe Flash, and even like the expanding bandwidth, sort of exploding bandwidth, PCIe uh, bus site. And um, you know, my career, it actually started at Berta Software, um, in, like the early 90s, and uh, on the engineering side. Um, Veritas Volume Manager, folks remember that. There you go, Stephen. I love Veritas Volume Manager. There you go. That. And uh, that wouldn't go that far, but <laughs> <laughs> like the fourth or fifth in, whatever, engineer or whatever on there. And um, one of the things I said, you know, after leaving Veritas to go to ZenSource where I ran products, was that it's going to be really hard for me to do another storage startup. And uh, but having said that, one of the things was the key ingredient was to have an engineering team that can create something differentiated. That was that was the important thing for for the three of us, right? We didn't want to do something that was just incrementally better here or did dedupe like 5% better than someone else and so on and so forth or gave like a 10% improvement on the dollar per gig. Um, you know, hats off to Kier and Andy. They had like the, some initial set of ideas that were very exciting. We founded the company in, uh, in October of 2011. We did a Series A uh, with Andreessen leading that round in, um, we closed that in, uh, September. Oh, this was September of oh, last year. And just about two weeks ago, we announced uh, closing our Series B with uh, Ignition leading the round and Andreessen uh, participating in it as well. Uh, at this point, we launched the company. And uh, thanks to, to you know, several or all of you in helping uh, make that a really, really good launch. And uh, you know, we are we announced our Series B a couple of weeks ago, and the product will be available later this month, so it's exciting times at uh, Yoho. So without too much more delay, let me introduce, uh, you probably already know, Andrew Warfield, co-founder and CTO at Coho. Andrew, take it away. Okay, I'm gonna just close this door so UPS doesn't uh, bring anything in. We'll... <laughs> Should be here. We'll see. The guy will be jumping up and down outside the window. Um, okay. Uh, so I don't think I need this keyboard. Uh, all right. So I'm uh, I'm Andy Warfield. Uh, one of the Hi, founders Andy. Of Coho. Nice to see you all in person. Um, I've tried to uh, I've tried to not spend very much time on the slides for this thing, which is uh, very enjoyable for me. It's the it's rare that I get to say that in front of a presentation. Um, so I'm hoping that you're going to ask a lot of questions and that we can go into stuff. Um, I'm going to give you a super fast um, overview of some of the problems that we wanted to look at when we started the company, and then I'm going to go into the weeds. Um, and the further we get into the weeds, the fewer slides I have. Uh, so if you don't ask questions, this will be a very short presentation indeed. Um, so wake up. I've, yeah, I've been promised uh, good stuff here. Um, okay, so 
So why did we, uh, why did we create uh, Coho? Um, so uh, we'd done the work on, on Zen. Uh, Kira and I uh, were, uh, were grad students at uh, Cambridge. We wrote Zen together uh, with, with the rest of the team at Cambridge during our PhDs. Um, we, uh, we then did a startup out of it. But the great thing with, with Zen was that it had an enormous amount of, uh, of success in open source uh, ahead of us doing a startup with it. Um, and so you know, it, was, it was pretty exciting to be solving these really hard technical problems, to be talking to the architecture teams at, at the chip vendors, right, at the CPU vendors, around how CPUs should evolve to support virtualization. Um, you know, to, to really be involved across a whole bunch of uh, industry participants around, uh, around doing that. And it gave us this really interesting sort of vantage point uh, as, we, as we started to move into this weird divergence that we've seen in the data center over the past like five or ten years, right? As, as, as Zen and VMware sort of initially took off, um, they did this really interesting thing, which was, you know, yes, they let you get better utilization on your servers and stuff, but they also decoupled the management of the physical plant, right, of the physical servers from the applications that were running on top of them, right? And this was the thing that really enabled the, the public cloud, right? That, that suddenly you could build utility-style uh, data centers, right? You could have a team of operations people that would maintain huge amounts of servers, um, and you could totally manage the software stack externally and independently of these things. And so one thing that we saw going through the commercialization of Zen, the productization of that stuff, uh, working with, with the enterprise side, and concurrently on the open source side, working with some of the large uh, public infrastructure companies that were building their own systems, right, using Zen, the open source project, was that virtualization was equally useful in both the public and the private cloud on the CPU. Right, that, that both environments really kind of took the same advantage in terms of getting better utilization and management on their servers. Um, however, on the network and storage side, this was less true. Right? Um, as the public cloud scaled, they started to run into network provisioning problems that led to them doing a whole bunch of stuff that they don't talk about very much. Right? In particular, buying ODM switching hardware and doing a lot of crazy stuff at the L2 right, on their networks. Um, in the private cloud, we're starting to see this with some of the, the deployment of OpenFlow to solve problems around VLAN provisioning and stuff. Um, with storage, right, it is the, the slowest pillar to make this move, right? With storage, on the enterprise side, we're very used to a form factor that talks about containers, right? You buy these big boxes, you buy them for five years, you replace them in five years, you plan for migration, so on and so forth. Um, we've talked about scale and storage historically, but scale has really been about getting more capacity. Um, in the public cloud, immediately, uh, storage was a problem, right? The margins on enterprise storage were high enough that they didn't match the margins that these guys were trying to sell compute for. Um, and so they had to really innovate, right? They, they had to, even in the early days of places like Amazon and Rackspace and Google, take advantage of commodity hardware, build up storage systems, hire some smart people to build them, and scale them out. And so there's, there's kind of two interesting lessons here as a, as a utility. One is that um, there are operationally based storage systems in the public cloud. These aren't storage products, right? You can't go and buy them, right? They have teams that are patching them and maintaining them continuously, but they're getting great economics off of the commodity hardware that they're based on. Um, and secondly, from a customer perspective, you aren't buying and committing on a five-year time frame. Right? You're not buying stuff that you're probably going to get good value out of in two years and probably be stressed about filling in five years. Right? You buy what you need when you need it. You pay for it as you need to pay for it. And so you know, the, the, the point that we kind of started with as we, as we sat down with the company was could we take some of these techniques, right? these utility-style techniques that were being deployed for storage in the public cloud and make them applicable to enterprises? Right? Could we let you purchase storage as you needed it, decoupled from the physical hardware that it ran on, and run it forever? That's kind of the, uh, the high-level idea. Now, I'm going to jump to the, to the punchline on this, and then I'm going to come back and talk about some of the details. So the punchline is that um, we're a software company that sells a software storage stack. Um, we uh, started the company anticipating that we would actually ship and deliver software. We could not find very many customers for whom that was an attractive model in today's enterprise data centers. 
right? The, the people that wanted to deploy software were, were the cheap DIY guys that wanted open source Zen to begin with, right there. They're not a, a big customer base yet. This is a growing area, um, but it's not something that, uh, that people by and large are ready for. Uh, secondly, building a storage product that people can trust demands a degree of hardware certification, right? It demands more than just fast, fast media. It needs, it needs carefully tested RAM and CPU and well-designed systems. And so the observation that we're making in Coho is that right now, commodity <coughs> is king for storage. And commodity is on the ascent in the data center, especially in terms of storage media and networking. And so we are shipping a completely software stack based on off-the-shelf commodity hardware. The hardware is designed to scale and incorporate changes in density and uh, performance as they emerge. So the idea is that you can buy our appliance this year to suit your storage needs. And next year, you can buy what we package on then as the new appropriate elbow in the price performance curve for storage. Right? You install those things next to each other, the system will rebalance and you'll get value out of those things. So you acquire storage over time, right? irrespective of, of the underlying physical investment. Um, so our GA product, which is coming out, uh, as Ramana said, at the end of the month, looks like this, right? It's a uh, slow to refresh on that display. Um, it's a 2U, it's a two, two server box. Um, it has four PCIe flashcards, which is going to be the, uh, the topic of a bunch of my discussion today. Um, it has a, uh, a slower disk tier of 12 3 terabyte drives off the back. Uh, it auto tiers across these things. It has four 10 gig Ethernet ports. Uh, into, uh, into the network. So it presents up uh, 40 <coughs> gigabits of, uh, of availability in, in 2U. Uh, the costing comes in, we compare not to other storage physical products, but actually to Amazon's pricing for storage, right? So we come in at slightly cheaper than what Amazon charges for provisioned IOPS uh, on a, on a four-year support contract, which is uh, 250 a gig. Um, in terms of performance, we can come back to this later, but just to kind of get to the, the performance end of the story, uh, because I, I'd like to kind of not spend loads of time obsessing about this stuff, uh, we did a, um, uh, uh, a joint benchmark with Intel and uh, ESG. Uh, this is an 80-20 fully random 4K workload. Uh, this workload is driven by 10 physical servers, each running eight virtual machines. Um, so we're, we're driving two 10 gigabit ports off of 10 servers, right? so 20 gigabits, 20 times 10 gigabits in. Um, eight VMs on each server, each independently doing 80-20 uh, random 4K I.O. And all we're doing here is we're plugging in extra of our boxes into the switch. Right? So what happens as you plug in the boxes is the data rebalances, the traffic rebalances, right? your storage just sort of spreads like a fluid across these boxes and performance ramps up. This is using NFS v3. Um, right, you can figure this is an NFS data store for VMware. Okay, so uh, any questions on the high level stuff? Or are you guys comfortable with me just diving into some of the details at this point? Yeah, right. we get the claim. Okay, <laughs> let's, let's see how it works. All right, fantastic. Um, Although okay. I did have a problem with that ESG logo. But... Oh, oh, come on. What is the first Don't we all? Right? <laughs> <laughs> love you, Steve. <laughs> Because it's not a Howard logo. Exactly. <laughs>